Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, um, Fresno State Talks, the whole committee, Brianna, Kari, Kristen, Megan. Uh, there's so many of you who have made this evening possible. I'm very, very proud uh, to be here. And thank you all um, uh, for coming this evening to listen to my talk on Who Cares? Genocide, Historical Memory, and Moral Responsibility. Okay, let's begin with a few facts. On April 24th, 1915, the Young Turk regime of the Ottoman Empire arrested 250 Armenian intellectuals, nearly all of whom were soon murdered. In the next four months, the regime murdered 800,000 Armenian citizens of the empire at a rate of 200,000 people a month, comparable to the Rwandan genocide. By 1916, that figure had grown to one million people. And by 1923, approximately 1.5 million people had been murdered by the Young Turk forces and nationalist forces of the Ottoman Empire and over 500,000 people dis displaced. Now, 100 years later, this crime against humanity, this genocide, remains unrecognized by the Republic of Turkey. And its historical reality is consistently questioned, even by our own federal government, many media outlets, and so-called academics. Thus, not only insulting the memory of millions of people, but also denying them historical justice and their inherent human dignity. In order to give you an idea of the impact of the genocidal policies of the Young Turk regime, I want to pull up a couple of maps that were put together by Professor Robert Hewson. Those of you who attended Matthew Karanian's lecture last week will have seen them. I think they um, illustrate really well the kind of human destruction we are talking about here. This is a map of Armenian, um, the Armenian vilayets in the Ottoman Empire around 1914, before the genocide. And if you could read the numbers, it says about 45% of Armenians worldwide were living in the Ottoman Empire in 1914. This map, 1926, right, shows that in the Republic of Turkey about 4% of Armenians now resided there. And if we go back, you can see red is where there are dense Armenian populations, and the less red they are, the fewer Armenians. And so we're talking about close to nothing in the historical areas of Armenia. Now, having said this, the Armenian Genocide has been recognized by important institutions and organizations and communities of scholars, including the International Association of Genocide Studies, which is the benchmark right, uh, for genocide recognition. So 20 countries, including the Vatican, and I just found out that today, although the United States uh, does not um, uh, formally recognize as, as, as a government, does not formally recognize the Armenian Genocide, 42 states Today, 43. South Dakota today also adopted a genocide resolution recognizing the Armenian Genocide. So I'm very happy to say that we're moving close to 50, and hopefully these state uh, resolutions will no longer be necessary as soon as the federal government adopts formal recognition of the genocide. Also important is Turkish scholars who have been coming out, re-examining their own past, right, and saying that this was a genocide and it's something that they have to deal with. This has been a, a movement that it started, has a lot of resistance within the Republic of Turkey, but nonetheless, it has steadily grown. And there are many people within the Republic of Turkey who have sort of gone against the official line and have thought independently that what happened was a crime against humanity. So that, I feel, is on the positive trend of uh, what's happening. Now, as I said, this is 100 years. And of course, we have chosen uh, to commemorate uh, the 100 years uh, since the genocide in a, in a number of fashion, a number of ways. Okay, so first of all, um, in Fresno, uh, an Armenian Genocide Centennial Committee was formed 
Uh, for a full list of its activities, you can go to www.agc.org, or you can also visit its Facebook page, facebook.com backslash AGC Fresno, and see everything that's going on. Obviously, our most prominent um, activity has been the building of a genocide memorial right here on Fresno State campus. And I'm very happy to say that the university has been completely supportive of this endeavor. This is the, uh, uh, taken a few days ago. Um, the, the monument is progressing apace. We are on schedule, I think even slightly ahead of schedule for completion by April 17th. And the unveiling will be on the night of April 23rd in an event that will be coordinated with the Republic of Armenia. So I also invite you and encourage you all to come out uh, for that event. We're very proud of this memorial. It recognizes, it's composed of nine pillars recognizing the six vilayets of historical Armenia, as well as Kilikia, the diaspora, and the Republic of Armenia. I think it's something that uh, we'll all be proud of, and I'm certainly proud to have been a part of this and to have joined with the Fresno Armenian community in making this happen. In addition, there will be a Philharmonic concert dedicated to the Armenian Genocide on April 25th. Um, I encourage you all to get your tickets for that. As well as a, there has been a special art exhibit at a Fresno uh, Art Museum. If you haven't been down there, I encourage you all to see that. There will be a town hall event on March um, 16th, and I encourage you all uh, uh, to attend that. Uh, as well as a number of art hop events and, and other concerts that will be um, held um, between now and April and into May. Uh, so there is a lot going on. I, I have to say, compared to what other communities are doing around the country, Fresno is really at the forefront of the commemoration of the 100th anniversary. It's an exciting uh, moment uh, to be here, and it's, it's been an exhilarating experience. We've been also having an educational outreach to schools to make sure that it's taught. Now, by, by law in California, the genocide is supposed to be taught in, 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 in schools. Uh, within the state of California, which is a great um, idea. The problem has been for teachers that the textbooks don't necessarily include a lot of information on the Armenian Genocide, and so they don't know exactly what they should be teaching. Some of the textbooks call it alleged. Some of the textbooks don't mention it at all. Some of them just have one line. And so uh, we um, went out to the schools to make sure that they were on, uh, uh, comfortable with teaching the Armenian Genocide, and we were very pleased and amazed to find out that they were actually very much engaged, they had accumulated materials, they were on top of this, and so from now on, at least in the next few years, we should see an increasing awareness of the Armenian Genocide, at least out of our um, high school graduates here in the Central Valley, so I'm very happy about that as well. All right, but having said all this, and noting that we're doing all this, why? And this comes to the controversial part, I guess, slightly of my lecture tonight. Why bother? And I hear this both from non-Armenians and Armenians. It happened a long time ago. Who really cares? Right? If you're not Armenian, what does it matter if a whole group of other people were massacred in some place that doesn't even exist, the Ottoman Empire, and people aren't really sure where it is? Right? Even amongst Armenians, they say, oh, remembering this, and..." Believe me, I know as we get closer to April 24th every year, everybody's, ugh. Right? There's a collective sort of side that this is a burden. The memory of this event is a burden. And it is, but it's also a responsibility. But they say, you know, this is stopping us from moving forward. And you hear this also from the State Department. Right? Oh, this obsession with the genocide is what keeps uh, Armenians and Turks from getting together. Right? And so I've had to ask myself, why? Why are we commemorating this? Why do we teach classes? Why do we build monuments? And tonight, I would like to share some of why I think it's important, not just for Armenians, but for everybody to be studying the Armenian Genocide. Because I feel that it is very much tied up with who we are today, not just as Armenians, but as a world, as a civilization, right? and very much tied into the whole notion of modernity. What I'm going to present today, not my own ideas, they've been based on the res my own research of a number of scholars. I won't have time to mention them all this evening. I will have a chance to mention one or two. But do realize that um, this is not just my own work, but really a lot of other people, a lot of genocide scholars, Armenian scholars out there, who have really put this together um, and make, made the case for why the Armenian Genocide is a significant event of human history in the 20th century. So, in looking at genocide and modernity, I'd like to focus on 
three aspects of how the Armenian Genocide is a phenomenon of modernity. First of all, I'd like to look at how it encapsulates the paradigm of genocide. Next, I'd like to look at how it was internationalized, unlike any other event previously, the internationalization of this issue. Right? And then finally, I'd like to look at how the Middle East as it is today is in large part due to the events that happened in 1915. All right, so these are three of the issues that I would look at the, uh, this evening before then turning on to questions of moral responsibility. So let's look at the paradigm of genocide. First of all, as in other genocides, right, Armenians were denigrated right, by the government and by local officials in newspapers publicly, right, described as vermin that needed to be eradicated or eliminated, unclean. Right? They were like a disease that need, to be, uh, uh, that need to be cleared out of the system of the Ottoman Empire. Right? There was a pattern to the extermination. Right? After having dehumanized the Armenian subjects of the uh, Ottoman Empire, they then systematically went about eliminating them. Right? Men were gathered and held and then marched out of town. Usually, very shortly thereafter, they were shot at a short distance or bayoneted if they wanted to save the bullets. Right? The elderly women and children uh, were told uh, that they would have to leave. Um, and then they were marched, often in circles, but through the desert, and, and finally into concentration camps, such as Der Zor. And uh, here you can see uh, a map of some of the routes that were taken. And then, as I noted at the outset of my talk, simultaneity, right, as we see in other genocides, one of the astounding, or at least remarkable, in, in terms of how incredible about genocides is how quickly they're enact, enacted. It makes them difficult, difficult to stop. Right? By the time um, four months had passed, 800,000, almost the majority of the, of the killing had already been done. Okay, so this simultaneity between April and August 1915, the Armenians of nearly every major town and village had been deported. And there's a picture of Armenians being deported from Kharpert. The city. So this simultaneity is actually quite important as it, we realize that this is not a random set of killings but an organized attempt to eliminate uh, a large portion of the population. And we can notice that it's not just in the border regions. One denial of the genocide says, well, they were moved because they were in the theater of war and we were evacuating them for their own benefit. It fails to account for the fact that, well, why, why Armenians in Ankara were deported and the Muslims and Turks weren't or why they were deported from other areas that were neither in historical Armenia nor uh, in, near the theater of war. All right, so we see from this map how many uh, uh, were deported from areas also outside of the historical regions um, uh, of Armenia. Technology. Right? Technology is something uh, obviously we're familiar with, but its implementation in the Armenian genocide was actually novel. Right? Orders were telegraphed. And it had just been invented, and, and, and so the, uh, we know that uh, Talat Pasha, the Minister of the Interior, would telegraph these orders to uh, local units throughout uh, the empire so that uh, the, the executions could take place. Right? New railway lines, something that would become very familiar with the Holocaust, were also used and transported Armenians into the, in packed cars where they often suffocated to death. Right? And to add insult to injury, Right. They were often forced to buy their ticket first, then packed into these cars, and often the train would stop in the middle of the desert. The, inhabitants, uh, the, the, the occupants were just taken out and murdered. All right. But again, we see the use of the telegraph, the use of uh, railway lines, these new inventions that were um, uh, becoming a major part of the 20th century being employed for the mass extermination of people. The Ottoman government also uh, formed a special organization, the Teshkilati Masusa, that was specifically designed to handle right, the deportation and execution of the Armenian population of the Ottoman Empire. And again, another phenomenon that we will see later on in other genocides through the 20th century. And finally, as I've already mentioned, Armenians were gathered in concentration camps. Again, something throughout the 20th century that would become a horrific reminder of the brutality that people could inflict on other people. So in places like Der Zor, where hundreds of thousands of people were gathered, starved to death, um, and, and basically left to die in, in the desert. 
Another aspect of the genocide that's, um, uh, I would say, a, a new development right, from previous genocides is its legalization. Again, something it'll share in common with later genocides. Right? Between May and December 1915, a series of laws were put into place, right? which basically authorized the deportation of Armenians and then the securing and seizure of their property. Right there you can see there's a receipt. And in fact, this was often uh, done with that the uh, Armenians would have to give a list of all of their belongings that they were leaving behind. And there would be a register in which uh, these items were listed. And they were told that upon their return, they would be able to reclaim them. When it was clear that they weren't returning, new laws were issued saying that any unclaimed property could be appropriated by the state and be given to new residents. And this process continued into the Republican era as well. It didn't end only with the, uh, with the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to Talat Pasha's own accounts, right, 20,545 buildings were confiscated, 267,536 acres of land, over 76,000 acres of vineyards, 703,000 acres of olive groves and 4, over 4,500 acres of mulberry gardens were confiscated. And this was found actually by a Turkish scholar right, in the documents that um, Talat Pasha himself had kept about the confiscation. What the actual total amount is, is still not entirely certain, but we have at least some idea of the immensity of the, uh, of the capital that was later um, that was confiscated by the Ottoman Empire and then incorporated into the Republic of Turkey. And also denialism, right? Denialism, the last stage often uh, called the final stage uh, of genocide. The genocide continues, as I mentioned, to be denied by the Republic of Turkey. And they give forth, usually these are the, I would say, arguments that they've uh, put forth. Systematic large-scale atrocities did not occur. That was sort of the early line that was taken um, often coupled with Armenians never really lived here. Once that became untenable, they realized that nobody believed that anymore. They started to switch um, their line of attack. Um, they said, well, yes, people were killed, but it does not constitute genocide. They were being relocated for their own benefit. And, you know, it was the early 20th century. Things weren't well organized. And by accident, they happened to die. Um, right? I, I remember, and I don't know if it's still this, but this was... Um, Back in 97, I was in Vaughan, the city of Vaughan, and they had a museum in Vaughan, and one room of the museum was dedicated to the Armenian genocide, at which we were completely shocked, and we realized very quickly that it was, was the genocide that the Armenians had committed against the Turks. When we asked the director, then where are all the Armenians, they, were, they didn't really have much of an answer. They said, oh, they left afterwards. Yeah, okay, and it wasn't very convincing, obviously. The other argument that they take, well, many Turks died in World War I as though this somehow negates uh, the atrocities that occurred. Right? Yes, a lot of Turks did die in World War I, and a lot of Armenians died. The difference was a lot of Turks died fighting in World War I, a lot of Armenians died because they were executed. Right? They even argued that the Armenians deserved it, that they were fifth column, they were siding with the Russians, and therefore, in order to maintain the stability of the state, in order to re uh, retain um, its, its uh, territorial integrity, they had to be eliminated, including old women and children. All right. So these are some of the arguments, including then discontinuity. Right. The, the current Republic of Turkey claims, well, this happened under the Ottoman Empire, and so we have nothing to do with it. Okay. That, that has to do with the past, and it should stay in the past, and we're not responsible what, for what happened in the Ottoman Empire. As I pointed out before, and I'll, I'll point out again, while the Republic of Turkey is not the Ottoman Empire, nonetheless, the actions of the Ottoman Empire led directly and were completely incorporated within um, the new Republic of Turkey, and particularly the wealth of the Armenians that was confiscated, confiscated helped start right, a new middle class within the Republic of Turkey. These are the negative sides. I also want to talk about some of the positive sides in the sense of human nature. If these were the negative sides of modernity um, with regards to the inhumanities that human beings can commit against each other, there was also an opportunity um, to show the better side of human nature. And this came forth through the internal, internal, internationalization of the Armenian Genocide. 
Right? People often say, well, you know, it's not that important. Nobody remembers it and it, nobody knew about it. This is completely untrue. People knew about the Armenian Genocide very well when it was happening and right afterwards. Okay? The New York Times had 200 articles on the, uh, 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 on the Armenian Genocide between 1915 and 1922. And here you can see million Armenians killed or in exile. Right? Armenian, uh, American Committee on Relief says victims of Turks are um, steadily increasing. Policy of extermination. Reports, also a very important uh, source of documentation for the Armenian Genocide, were the reports of the American ambassador to Turkey, Henry Morgenthau, right? and also American missionaries and, and I mean, American consuls stationed in the empire. America was neutral for most of the war, the first years of it, and, and during the part in which most of the killing took place. So America did have people stationed there who were able to see, to be eyewitnesses to what were, was occurring. And they wrote back horrific reports that really alarmed the populace. Right? And not to mention, right, Franz Werfel's book, 40 Days of Musadagh, published in 1933, was an international bestseller. So people were very much aware of what happened. Now, during the course of the 30s, that sort of recognition started to change. And there are a variety of reasons for that. But one of the things I can mention is when MGM wanted to make this book into a movie, the State Department squashed it. We can start seeing the change happening in American policy starting in the 30s as well. And Hitler put the, uh, the 40 Days of Musadach, uh, it was one of the first books to be indexed, that is banned and burned uh, within Nazi Germany, because he realized that if this book uh, continued to be read, it would highlight what he was going to do to the Jews. So we can see um, uh, the analogies uh, between those two events here as well. Relief efforts, however, were quite extraordinary. Um, uh, in response to the Armenian Genocide, was founded the uh, American Com uh, Committee for Relief in the Near East, which still exists as the Near Eastern Relief Fund. This is one of their famous posters um, that uh, uh, circulated at that time to raise money. And between uh, 1916 and 1930, the U.S. raised $116 million in relief money for Armenians and other people who were affected by the Armenian Genocide, including Assyrians. Okay. This is the equivalent of $1.5 billion today. That is the largest relief effort ever launched. How many of us have learned about this in school? This is one of the great moments of American history in which we stepped forward and tried to help people, and yet this isn't taught in school. Right. Not because it's not an important part of our past. In fact, it was so important Babe Ruth even auctioned one of his baseball bats. Right? It was a home run baseball bat, and he, he gave it to Navart Zeron, right, to, who, was, who was actually quite a, a famous celebrity at the time uh, for representations of her as the daughter of Armenia, Goshkarian. And he gave her a baseball bat to be auctioned in, uh, for the relief of Armenian orphans. Okay? This is a moment in American history when we start to get involved in world affairs and see our role as a humanitarian. Right, a giver of humanitarian aid. Right? And yet, our children aren't taught this. I don't think it's by accident. The Armenian Genocide was also important for defining genocide. Right? The word genocide did not exist in 1914. If you remember the newspaper clipping I had up just a little while ago, right, we see that it didn't use the word genocide. It didn't exist. And we can see news reporters, journalists, trying to grapple Right, with what was going on, trying to find words, mass extermination, right, untold millions murdered, right, attempt at annihilation. There was no term that would encompass what was going on there in their minds, in their vocabulary. And it wasn't until 1944 that the term genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin, himself a Polish Jewish jurist who had um, uh, suffered through the Holocaust and lost most of his family during the Holocaust. Um, he had been active in, 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 in crimes against humanity and in trying to define and prevent them before the Holocaust. And he talks about how when he was young, growing up and learning about the Armenian Genocide. And this was one of the case examples for him, one of the reasons why he got involved um, in, in, in studying crimes against humanity. Right? He, didn't, he didn't limit himself to just the Holocaust or the Armenian Genocide. He took it on a long view. But nonetheless, the Armenian case was uh, very formative in his own coming to terms with what was going on and in formulating the word genocide. 
Finally, the genocide has also had a big impact on the modern Middle East. And so for anybody who's studying the modern Middle East, this is an absolutely important dimension that needs to be looked at. Right? First of all, it destroyed a vital cultural and economic se uh, sector of Anatolia, a rather large part of the Middle East. Right? It also caused the Armenian diaspora, right? a, a modern phenomenon that spans now the globe. Without the genocide, the, mo the modern Armenian diaspora would not be in existence. So the, the loss of Armenians in the Middle East contributed to the uh, existence of Armenians elsewhere. Right? It's part of the economic basis for the Republic of Turkey. As I said, the appropriation of that Armenian capital allowed the Republic of Turkey to form its modern economy. Right? Without that Armenian capital, well, it would have been a completely different world if the genocide had never happened. And the role that Armenians would have played in the Republic of Turkey would have been an incredible one. We'll never know what that counter history would be. Because this actually begins the process of the ethno-religious cleansing of the Middle East that we see continuing to this day. Right? If we look at the Middle East in the 19th century, it is a very culturally and religiously diverse area. As we move through the 20th century into the present, we see that diversity start to shrink. And the Middle East and the countries within it are the losers of this process. But now we still continue it with the recent developments in Syria. We see this pattern continuing and again on a genocidal level as ISIS tries to take over and is murdering Christians as well as other Muslims. It's not even enough to have um, uh, uh, other religious faiths, but to, to reduce it to one particular interpretation of one religious faith. So we see, but this process of nationalism and of purity, ethno-religious purity, right, we see this process beginning with the Armenian Genocide. Okay? It's not the only thing there, and it hasn't been a constant um, development, but we can, we can chart its progress starting in the early 20th century and moving today. So in order to understand the modern contours of the Middle East, one really has to know uh, the Armenian Genocide. And finally, it also reverberates in the current conflict of Nagorno-Karabakh. I'm sure most Armenians uh, are familiar with this. Many non-Armenians might not be familiar with the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, but it is still considered one of the hot spots in the world today where a much larger conflict could erupt at any moment. There is a, an enclave of Armenians in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, which has become a self-proclaimed uh, republic um, that is incorporated or is surrounded by the Republic uh, of Azerbaijan. Uh, they fought for their independence, and they have won at least uh, in their for themselves, uh, a degree of autonomy, although they're not recognized even by the Republic of Armenia as independent. But one of the, one of the touchstones for that conflict is the fact that never again. Right? Armenians will never again allow themselves right, to be executed in the way that happened in 1915. And so the, the, the Armenian genocide continues to penetrate right, current political conflicts in the Middle East, and therefore is another reason why this needs to be studied not only by Armenians and, and genocide scholars, but by political sciences uh, across uh, the humanities. Now, I want to talk a bit about historical memory and moral responsibility. Is genocides, and in particular, I'd say the denial of the Armenian genocide, uh, present us with a challenge. And one of these challenges is the competing narrative discourse that's very popular in academia. Right? Because we can't ascertain the truth objectively, what we have are stories on either side, narratives on either side. So the Turks have their narratives, and the Armenians have their narrative, and we sort of look at them equally. It's almost a journalistic approach to scholarship. You have point A, point B, and the journalist tries to be in the middle. Right? This doesn't work. And, and there are, I have to say, there, is a, there was a, a whole uh, volume of the, or a whole issue of the Middle East critique dedicated to this sort of approach Right, to uh, the Armenian Genocide. Right? Not only is it historically incorrect, right, it's morally wrong. There aren't two stories to the Armenian Genocide. Right? There's one story of what happened. Or we can say there are many stories of the survivors, and that's fine. But there isn't just genocide happened, genocide didn't happen, and let's debate. Genocide didn't happen is not a story. It's a political position. The genocide is a historical fact. And these two can't be put on the same level. And in fact, to even entertain 
that equality right, is a morally questionable project in and of itself. In addition to this competing narrative stories, we already get agentless passive voices being used all the time. Armenians were murdered. Armenians were killed. Armenians died. With people really hesitant to say, by whom? Right? We find ourselves. I find myself doing this. Right? When we talk about the Armenian genocide, 1.5 Arme million Armenians were killed. By whom? Right? It's important to remember that they didn't just disappear, that they didn't just die. Right? They were killed by an agent. Right? And that agent was the Ottoman Turkish regime of the Young Turks. Right? This moral distancing, which has been, psychologists call this a moral distancing using the agent passive, agentless passive voice, right? is understandable because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to think that people could do this to one another. And yet we need to be honest about it. We need to say who did it. We need to be clear about who did it so that we can start to overcome the trauma of the genocide itself. Likewise, right, we find a silencing of the victim's stories. Right? They talk about these two stories, but I can't tell you the number of times you will hear, well, yeah, that was a survivor. Of course they're exaggerating. Of course they're biased. Who's going to believe them? And this is also by Armenian scholars, not consciously in that way, but they tend not to bring forth survivor accounts as evidence, right? Because it's, naturally it's biased. Why? If we're going to have these stories, right, we need to take these voices into account. They are actually important testimonies to what happened. Thankfully, a number of oral archives have started across the country because now we're losing those voices that are alive. It's 100 years. After 100 years, there's hardly anybody alive who can actually tell these stories anymore. Thankfully, a number of people over the decades have taken these down, have recorded them, have preserved them for posterity. Right? But we have to recognize how important these are right? as pieces of evidence, as testimonies to the truth. Finally, I want to end on what may seem like a bit of a strange picture, although Nora probably recognizes it. This is a scene of Priam approaching Achilles to ask for his son Hector back. I present this to my class. This is in the final book of the Iliad. Right? Hector um, has been killed by Achilles after having killed Achilles' friend Patroclus. Achilles kills Hector, takes his body, refuses to give it back, drags it around the, the walls of Troy. Right? Every day he, 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 he sort of takes it out to denigrate it. Right? And Priam, Hector's father, is told that he should go and try and get his son's body back. So he makes this journey into the enemy camp right? to retrieve um, the body of his son. Now, the catalyst right, that allows Achilles to give Hector back to Priam is that both of them share a memory. Right? They both remember. They don't share the same memory, but they both share a moment of remembering. What I like about this particular part of the Iliad is that it underscores how important remembering is to our being human, and that actually Remembering is not stopping us from going forward. It's the catalyst that allows us to engage in acts of humanity. It doesn't stop the war. The war will continue to go on. More people will get killed. It doesn't pretend to be that huge right, of a factor. But it does insert itself as a human act in the middle of a bloody chaos. And so if this year, we can help remember the beauty and fragi fragility of human life through our acts of commemoration and of memory. I would say we have done a marvelous thing and moved this whole discussion forward. Thank you all very much for being here this evening. And thank you again, Lucy, for inviting me. Have a good night.